In this video, we'll be going over the introduction to thermochemistry, which is chapter 5 in your textbook, and some of the common problems that you'll see in this chapter. So most of this chapter is all about different ways to calculate energy, and we have different kinds of energies. The first kind of energy that's discussed in chapter 5 is kinetic energy, which as the name implies, kinetic being motion, is the energy associated with movement. The equation that we're given for kinetic energy is that kinetic energy, or E subscript K, is equal to one-half m u squared, where m is the mass and u is the velocity or the speed of the object. If you've taken a physics class, you might have seen this equation written as one-half mv squared, where v is used instead of u for velocity. It's the same equation used in the same way. The special thing about this equation is that everything must be in the standard SI units. So for mass, the standard SI unit therefore is a kilogram, not a gram. For U, the standard SI unit is going to be meters per second, which is the standard unit for velocity. The most common mistake that I see with this equation is not having everything in the right unit specifically the mass being left in grams instead of kilograms. So make sure that when you're using this equation, you always convert the mass to kilograms. And I've written up to the side some helpful conversion units that may help you with that. AMUs, or atomic mass units, are equal to 1.661 times 10 to the negative 24th grams, or reciprocal Avogadro's number, 1 over 6.062 times 10 to the 23rd and 1,000 grams is equal to 1 kilogram. So these are the conversion units we use. So let's look at our first problem here. Calculate the kinetic energy of a helium atom moving at a speed of 125 meters per second. So they've given us the velocity, and they want to know what is the kinetic energy. So let's go ahead and get started. We know the velocity, but we do not know the mass. But we are told that it is a helium atom. So m in this problem is going to be the mass of one helium atom. So how do you find the mass of a helium atom? Well, if you look on the periodic table, it says that helium has a mass of 4.003, and that is an atomic mass unit, or grams per mole. We need it in the unit of kilograms, so that's where these conversion units come in over here. So the first conversion unit to turn those AMUs to grams, and the second one to turn them to kilograms. So conversion unit factors here, AMUs to grams, so grams on top, AMU drops to the bottom. Pull from the first conversion unit, 1 with AMU, and 1.661 times 10 to the negative 24 with grams. That will get rid of AMUs, and next, grams drops to the bottom, and we want to be left with kilograms. So the second conversion unit, 1 kilogram and 1,000 grams. So when you multiply across and divide across the bottom, AMUs will cancel, grams will cancel. You'll be left with kilograms, and plug all this into your calculator, you should end up with 6.649 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So that is the mass of a helium atom in kilograms. So at this point, all we need to do is plug it back in this equation to find the kinetic energy. Now make sure when you're plugging this in that only the u, only the velocity, gets squared. So it's 1 half times 6.649 times 10 to the 24th, 27th, times, and then 125 gets squared. Only the 125 gets squared. So when you plug all this in, you should end up with 5.19 times 10 to the negative 23. Now note about the units. We end up with kilograms, and then the meters get squared, and seconds are on the bottom, and they also got squared. So a kilogram meter squared per second squared, which by definition, that is a joule. 
your final answer is 5.19 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules. And that is the answer to the question, what is the kinetic energy of a helium atom moving at a speed of 125 meters per second? So again, biggest mistake I see is forgetting to convert the mass all the way to kilograms. I see a lot of students leaving it in grams, especially if the question gave it in grams. So make sure, sure, sure that you always convert to kilograms for this equation. It must be in kilograms. The second kind of energy that was discussed in our textbook was electrostatic energy, which is the energy of attraction or repulsion between charged particles, whether those are charged subatomic particles like electrons and protons, or charged ions such as a sodium ion and a chloride ion. And the equation that we're given is basically a derivation of Coulomb's law, where the electrostatic energy is not equal to, this, this funny looking symbol here is proportional to. Proportional means when one side goes up, the other side goes up by the same amount. So when the other side goes down, this side will go down by the same amount. That's what proportional means. Electrostatic energy is proportional to Q1, which is the charge of the first, times Q2, which is the charge of the second, divided by the distance. And since we're dealing with proportionality, the units don't matter so much as long as they're consistent. So let's look at this in a question. Because we're not calculating an actual answer, we're just, com we're just looking at proportionalities. Questions about electrostatic energy will always be in terms of comparison. Which one is bigger? Or how many times bigger is it type questions? Since you can't actually calculate electrostatic energy from Coulomb's law. So the first question we have is, how much greater is the magnitude of electrostatic attraction between an electron and a nucleus containing three protons versus that between an electron and a nucleus containing one proton, assuming that the distance is the same in each case? So I like to visualize this with pictures. So I'm going to draw the two different scenarios, scenario A and scenario B. So scenario A is an electron which has a charge of negative one, so I'm negative one and a nucleus that contains three protons. So if I have three protons in my nucleus, I'm going to have a charge of three plus, plus three. So that is our, my first scenario. In my second scenario, then, I have a electron and a nucleus that contains just one proton. So negative one for my electron, and my nucleus contains just one proton, so it would be plus one. And it's saying that assume the distance is the same in both cases, so I'm just going to call this a generic D for distance, and just D is the same in both cases. So the question is how much greater? So obviously this one's going to have greater attraction because it's going to have stronger charges, and charges are on the top. If the distance was different, then that would affect the bottom. So looking at this equation, we're just going to plug in these numbers into that equation and find that for the first scenario, the electrostatic attraction is proportional to first Q is a negative one, second Q is a plus three, and on the bottom we just have the distance. In the second scenario, it's going to be minus one and plus one, divided by the same D. Now I'm comparing these two things. So if I'm comparing the two things and they have something in common, in other words, D, then I can pretty much just ignore D and cancel that out. So I'm going to cancel out D and just compare the two scenarios. Multiplying negative one times positive three will give me negative three, negative one times positive one will give me negative one. Now notice, here's where students get confused because they want to say negative three is smaller than negative one. And sure it is on a number line, but we're asking how much greater is the magnitude. Magnitude. So magnitude means the amount. The magnitude of negative three is greater than the magnitude of negative one. The fact that it's negative just means that one of the charges was negative. So don't get confused with that negative. If you really that is confusing you, you can just go ahead and ignore that when you're dealing with electrostatic attraction. Ignore the negatives. So the question really is how much greater is the magnitude of three versus the magnitude of one? And of course, the answer is it is three times greater. Three times greater. So questions like this are always going to be comparing. Which one is greater? Or could you end up with them being the same uh, energy? 
or if it is great, one side is greater, how many times greater? So those are the kind of questions you'll see with electrostatic energy. The next types of energies that were discussed in Chapter 5 are heat, which is given the symbol Q, and work, which is given the symbol W. So heat and work, Q and W, add up to something called internal energy. So internal energy, or total internal energy, is given by the symbol delta U, and it is equal to the sum of heat Q and work W. So pretty simple straightforward equation. I'm just adding heat and work. The trick with these questions is that heat and work can be positive or negative depending on what exactly is going on in the process, what is happening to the system versus the surroundings. So here's a little table to help you figure out when heat is positive or negative and when work is positive or negative. So heat's pretty straightforward. If the system is absorbing heat, which is by definition an endothermic process, one in which the system absorbs heat, then you're going to have a positive amount of work. If heat is being released by the system, which by definition is an exothermic process, then your heat is going to be negative from the point of view of the system. When work is done on the system by the surroundings, and when you're dealing with volume changes, that's a volume decrease, then work will be positive. When we see the opposite, where the system is doing the work, and it's doing it to the surroundings, then work is negative. So let's see this in a problem real quick. Calculate the overall change in internal energy, delta U, in joules for a system that absorbs 188 joules of heat and does 141 joules of work on its surroundings. So internal energy again is delta U and it's equal to the sum of Q plus W. So Q is the heat and it says that the system absorbs 188 joules of heat. So Q, the heat, is going to be 188 joules. And because the system is absorbing it, when the system is absorbing heat, Q is positive. So this 188 joules is going to be a positive number. Now the work is given to be 141 joules. And the system does the work. So if the system does the work, the work is done by the system, not by on the system, then work is negative. So even though it doesn't say negative 141 in the problem, because of the wording, we know that that is a negative work. So we need to go here and make this a negative before we plug into our equation and add them. So now we plug in our equation and add them up, and we get positive 188 joules minus 141 joules. Add these up, plug them into your calculator, and you should get 47 joules as your answer. In this next problem, we're going to introduce stoichiometry as it relates to thermochemical equations. Stoichiometry from chapter 3 deals with looking at a chemical reaction and from the amount of one thing in the chemical reaction determining the amount of something else in the chemical reaction. We did that using those three steps of stoichiometry. Convert to moles, multiply by the molar ratio, and then convert back to grams or whatever other unit you were looking for. In chapter 4 we were looking for milliliters of an acid base a titration. In this problem, it's still going to be the same idea. I'm going to be given the amount of something in the equation and asked for the amount of something else, but now one of those things is going to be the amount of energy because we're going to be writing amount of energy as a term in the chemical equation. So here's an example of this. Given the thermochemical equation for photosynthesis, you probably know what photosynthesis is, the process by which plants take up water and carbon dioxide and make sugar, which we then can eat, and oxygen, which we use to breathe. We also know that there's a third component required for plants to do photosynthesis, not just water and carbon dioxide, they also need sunlight. So that is solar energy. 
and given this balanced chemical equation for six moles of water, six moles of carbon dioxide, making one mole of glucose or simple sugar, six moles of oxygen has a delta H or requires the enthalpy of 2,803 kilojoules per mole of reaction and it's positive because this is endothermic, it takes in energy. This question asks, calculate the solar energy required to produce 75 grams of glucose, C6H12O6 here. So the same rules are going to apply. I can go from anything in this equation to anything else, including my energy term, as long as I'm first in moles, and then I can multiply by that molar ratio. So remember, again, three sets of stoichiometry, get to moles, multiply by the molar ratio, get back to the unit you're looking for. So first step, I'm going to take this 75 grams of glucose and I want to get it to moles because you can't do anything with a chemical equation until you're in moles. So 75 grams of glucose and to convert from grams to moles we divide by the molar mass. So to get the molar mass of glucose add up 6 carbons, 12 hydrogens, and 6 oxygens you should get a molar mass of approximately 180.2 grams per mole when you do that. So divide by 180.2 and you will get that you have 0 0.416 moles of glucose. So now that I'm in moles, I can use that molar ratio to go to anything else in the equation. So in chapter three, these questions were generally then asking, well, then how many grams of carbon dioxide could be made? So we were then multiplying by the molar ratio of, well, six moles of carbon dioxide per every one mole of glucose. But this question is asking for the amount of energy. So we're going to go from glucose to energy. So I'm going to use that energy term just the same as I'd use anything else in the molar ratio. Whatever you, cur you started with drops to the bottom, so I started with moles of glucose, so that drops to the bottom, so those cancel. And whatever I want goes on top. I want the energy. Well, my energy term is given in the problem to be 2,803 kilojoules per mole of the reaction. So when I multiply across here, my moles of glucose will cancel. Now, what number goes in front of moles of glucose? Well, it's the stoichiometric coefficient. Remember from chapter three, that is your molar ratio. This ratio is the stoichiometric coefficients. Now, there's an understood one here, so I'm just going to put a one down there. If I had been going from, say, oxygen, where I have six oxygens, then a six would have gone with oxygen. So make sure on the top, bottom, where, right, say, where it says one, this is only one because there's an understood one in front of glucose. If there had been a two here, there would have been a two here. So don't forget your molar ratio comes from those stoichiometric coefficients. That's where it came from, which are just the numbers in front of your species in the equation. So plug this in your calculator, 0 0.416 times 2,803 and you should get uh, 1,166. We've only got three significant figures here, so I'm going to round that to 1,170, and our units are in kilojoules. Now, because I'm being asked to calculate energy, the unit for energy is in joules or in kilojoules, I'm already good to go. I'm already in kilojoules. So that actually ended up only being two, two steps instead of the full three steps of stoichiometry. Convert to moles, multiply by molar ratio. I'm already in the unit I want, so I am good to go. So just be very careful with this. Make sure that you use the molar ratio that came from the stoichiometric coefficients. And I could have also asked this question in reverse, and this is, by the way, this is sample problem 5.3 from your textbook. If you'd asked this question in reverse, just like uh, in that same problem, it asks practice problem B to reverse, calculate the mass 
of oxygen produced from a certain amount of energy, then you would be starting with energy, working this problem backwards. So the first step is from your energy, multiply by the molar ratio, get to moles, and then convert to grams to work it backwards, such as that practice problem B. So this is one way of calculating enthalpy for reaction if you're given a balanced chemical reaction and the amount of one of the reactants or products. Now in this next problem, this is the start of calorimetry. Calorimetry is a way of determining the amount of heat in a reaction or in a physical process by measuring the change in its temperature over time. So these generally happen in calorimeters, and there's a couple of different kinds of calorimeters. But the equation that we use for most of these is Q, heat, is equal to SM delta T. I have a student who likes to call this Q is equal to SMAT, where the delta looks like an A, SMAT. Whatever it takes so that you remember this equation is fine. It's Q, heat, is equal to S, specific heat, M, the mass, delta T, delta meaning change, or the change in temperature. So S, the specific heat, varies from substance to substance. Most of these calorimetry problems you see the occur in water. So the specific heat of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. M is the mass. Now, because the specific heat unit is in per gram, we need that mass to cancel out that unit. So in this equation, mass must be in grams. Delta T is the change in temperature. Any delta, of course, is final state minus initial. So it is important to note in calorimetry that you can have water or whatever your substance is increasing in temperature, in which case your final temperature would be higher than your lower temperature, such as in this case, where our final temperature was 90.5 degrees Celsius and our initial temperature was 25.2 degrees Celsius. In this case, where your final temperature is higher, you're increasing in temperature, you'll end up with a positive delta T. So this ends up being positive 65.3 degrees Celsius. But if we had a process where the water instead was cooling or going down in temperature and your final temperature is lower, then this delta T would give you a negative temperature. So make sure you pay attention. It's not just a uh, absolute value of the difference when we're dealing with change. It can be positive or negative depending on if it's increasing or decreasing. But in this case, it's increasing, so it's going to be positive. At this point, we just plug into our equation, make sure all of our units cancel out. So when we do this, as far as units, grams, as we already mentioned, will cancel. The other unit that cancels is degrees Celsius. So the unit that we are left with in this problem is joules. Plug all this into your calculator, the specific heat, the mass of your water, and the change in temperature of the water, and you should get a rather large number here. Now we've only got three significant figures, so that rather large number, I'm going to go ahead and round, it's going to be 6, 69,700 joules here. Now the question though asked for kilojoules, so kilo means a thousand, so last step is to convert joules to kilojoules by dividing by a thousand, so we'll end up with a final answer of 69.7 kilojoules, and that is our final answer.